The Boyne Valley is home to one of Ireland's two World Heritage Sites, Bruna Boyne. On a bend on the River Boyne, a sophisticated Stone Age society built a series of tombs for their dead. Massive constructions that stand to this day. A testament to the ancient Irish who built them. There are three main sites. Nowth, which comprises a large burial mound surrounded by smaller mounds and outlying constructions. Douth, which has had little excavation, gives a sense of how these tombs looked for thousands of years before preservation and reconstruction. But arguably, the most significant site of all is Newgrange. A massive burial mound built over 5,000 years ago, Newgrange is Ireland's most striking prehistoric site. The flat-topped cairn is some 80 metres across and contains 200,000 tonnes of construction material, an extraordinary building challenge in Stone Age times. The cairn was built with stone carried up from the River Boyne just below. But the white quartz of its façade was brought from County Wicklow. And most of the curb stones, the huge boulders used around the edge of the mound, were transported from as far away as Clogher Head in County Loud, 20 kilometres away. Newgrange is a very special place. It was inscribed by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site in 1993, and it's considered of outstanding universal value. Its construction and it, its architecture is a spectacular example of the achievements and sophistication of the Neolithic people who built it. With its glorious spirals, the massive entrance stone at Newgrange is regarded as one of the finest pieces of New Stone Age art in Europe. Many of the other curb stones are also carved, some out of sight on their inner surfaces. But you have to travel into the mound to see Newgrange at its most remarkable. A long, narrow passageway leads to the very heart of the tomb and opens out into a large burial chamber. Here on giant stone basins, these Stone Age Irish laid out the bones of their dead. Were they kings, queens, warlords or druids? We will never know for sure. Whoever they were, they must have been important to deserve such an extraordinary final resting place. But perhaps the most famous feature of Newgrange is not a carved rock or gravestone, but a small opening through a stone roof box situated above the entrance to the passage. At dawn on the shortest day of the year, the direct light from the rising sun penetrates all the way to the innermost chamber through this opening in the roof box. What a lot of people don't realise is as you enter up into the chamber from the passage, you're actually rising all the time. So you actually have to get right down onto the ground, literally right down, and your head has to actually be right flat down almost in this position, to see the light shining in from the roof box. To make this happen, 200,000 tonnes of burial mound had to be constructed with great accuracy and a profound understanding of the sun's journey through the heavens. For the new Stone Age culture of the Boyne Valley, the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, marked the start of the new year a sign of nature's rebirth, the longer days promising the return of warmth and new life to the land. It may also have served as a powerful symbol of the victory of life over death, perhaps promising rebirth to the spirits of the dead. This is the first year ever since I started work at Newgrange that we've had no visitors inside the chamber for the winter solstice. We miss our visitors greatly. We're looking forward to their return, but 
it occurred to us that this was an opportunity to really investigate what is happening at sunrise during the winter solstice because when will we have the chamber of Newgrange empty again? One morning I was in the chamber earlier than usual when the first beam of light came in. It was in a place completely different to where I expected it. And you would think after more than 30 solstices that there would be no surprises for me. I think we focus too much on the week of the winter solstice and we haven't taken into effect what's happening before and after. The builders of the monument designed it so that the roof box only would be left open because you can see to the right hand side of the door there's a big stone doorway whereas we have to leave the doorway open so we can get in and out. An awful lot of light comes through the doorway. So we needed to block that off. So we have carpenters, stonemasons, geos um, and one of our carpenters, Michael Boyne, came out to site and he made a template that would fit that snugly. By blocking the passage, what we get is isolating the light in the roof box from the passage. We're now able to experience the sunbeam in the chamber as it was designed to be seen. So this is something we have never experienced before. That will make a big difference to our understanding. Because the chamber is empty, we'll be able to see how it moves across the floor. So we do know that the, the light enters the chamber from around the 9th or 10th of, of December each year. It's only on the solstice that it will extend to its maximum distance into the chamber and it should reach as far as the basin here beside me. 5,000 years ago it would have hit the wall behind us. Because the Earth's axis relative to the Sun has changed in the intervening 5,000 years, there's a time-telling device. This monument has lost four minutes in 5,000 years which is pretty good as watches go. Our objective here is to record the light 15 days before solstice and 15 days afterwards to then give us more data than we've ever had about the behaviour of light in the chamber. So this image is what we're looking for. If we had a good sunrise, this is the solstice light entering the chamber at Newgrange. Here it is, maybe five, ten minutes later, where it's a little bit stronger. It's leaving the chamber. It gives off, uh, I suppose, quite a dramatic glow. On an average morning when we don't get a good sunrise, this is the kind of image that we capture. You'll see basically there's a blue light, which is daylight, coming into the roof box to the floor of the chamber. We can do so much in here with technology, but really the project is in the hands of the weather, so let's pray to the gods for some good sunshine. Every opportunity you get to, to better understand a monument, you learn how to better protect the monument and, and really that's, that's the, the work of the National Monument Service and the Office of Public Works. I think this is an excellent example of a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we've had archaeologists, conservation architect, photography, uh, Dr Frank Prendergast in terms of um, archaeoastronomy. It's that collaboration that's so important. Put yourself in the mindset of people in the Neolithic and their worldview. Out of that horizon, rose and set, the sun, moon, and all of the stars. And that must have been a magical and a captivating spectacle. How did that integrate into their belief system and their daily lives? And it is understanding that element in the belief system of a prehistoric culture that is the challenge of cultural astronomy which is why this element is being incorporated into the bigger project now, using this instrument here, which is a digital theodolite, top-mounted with a camera, and the whole idea is to capture a panorama of overlapping photographs and build a model of the horizon around Newgrange. This is how we work, gathering data, and then hopefully drawing meaningful conclusions that are archaeologically grounded. There's still loads of secrets left here. The amount of new information that we have learned in the past five years surpasses the amount of information we learned in the last 50 years.
but the complexity of what these people were able to achieve is astounding and it is very slowly being revealed to us.